Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 8th of October 2020 today. These webinars are hosted by my colleague and friend Sebastian Geiger at Heliot Watt University and myself from TU Delft. We are especially grateful to our keynote speakers who have supported this initiative graciously and to you all for joining us in combat work from home isolation. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, which has received more than 1300 subscribers by now. It would allow you also go through the history and the archives, as well as get notifications for the upcoming ones. Uh, also to the junior researchers, especially, uh, please note there is a Tea Time Talk series run by junior researchers, mostly for you all. Volunteer, participate, get engaged, and build up your professional network as soon as possible with them. So um, now to the lecture of this week. It's our uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Cortes Oldenburg to you all as our keynote speaker of this week. Uh, Kurt is a senior scientist and head of the Geology Carbon Sequestration Program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California, the US. His area of expertise is numerical model development and applications for carpet subsurface flow and transport processes. Kurt is the author of more than a hundred peer-reviewed papers and book chapters, the author of a textbook on CCS uh, entitled Introduction to Carbon Capture and Sequestration by uh, colleagues Smith, uh, Reiner, Oldenburg, and, and Gerhard. He is the editor-in-chief of a Storage of Greenhouse Gases, Science and Technology. In the past 20 years of research on geology carbon sequestration, Kurt Gert has uh, worked on many topics, including CO2 enhanced gas recovery, leakage and seepage modeling and monitoring in the shallow subsurface, pipeline and well leakage, including well blowout modeling and overall risk assessment. Kurt holds PhD in geology from University of California, beautiful Santa Barbara. Uh, he actually started his PhD from my research uh, at Princeton, and uh, he then moved with his advisor to Santa Barbara, but he's here so to speak about that. But then uh, also did his undergrad studies in, again, geology at the University of California in Berkeley, not so far from where he works today. He holds several awards, and I would just list a few of them uh, due to the time uh, limit that we have. Uh, he received already 100 awards to the 56 developers of the National Risk Assessment Partnership Projects, computational tools for assessing and managing risk of geology carbon sequestration. Also, he received uh, for two times the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Directors Award for exceptional achievements, one for societal impact related to work at the Aliso Canyon Natural Gas and the second one related to tech transfer for the tough uh, simulator that many of you know. Also, he received the Department of Energy, the OE Secretary's Achievement Award in 2011 for the work on deep water horizon oil spill flow rate. In addition, he received the Geothermal Resources Council Best Paper Award for his co-authored paper related to the Northwest Geysers EGS Enhanced Geothermal uh, System Demonstration. He also received the USGS Director's Award for Exemplary Service to the Nation and Global Citizen Group Award at the United Nations East Bay Bank in 2008 for contribution to IPCC, the International Panel Related to Carbon Storage, Special Report on Carbon Dioxide Capture and Storage. He also shares the Nobel Peace Prize of 2007 with Al Gore and many others for his contribution in the IPCC special report on carbon dioxide capture and storage. Please do visit uh, his uh, page at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and also his Google Scholar page, which would allow you to visit his uh, groundbreaking contribution in the climate, energy, and water resources research. It's a pleasure to host you here uh, this week. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our, our invitation for being so early. Uh, in California at this time. Uh, to the audience, please note his lecture will last for about half an hour, 30-35 minutes, and followed by questions and discussions like before, 
please type in, chat, uh, in uh, your questions in the chat room and Sebastian will uh, chair the discussion session with you. Um, please do not wait until the end of the lecture. Post your questions whenever you feel appropriate. It might also trigger other questions as well. Without any further ado, I would like to give the, the stage, the bandwidth, the screen to your Thank you once more. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Hadi. Well, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. So I really thank you, Hadi and Sebastian and anyone else who helps organize this series. I think you've made something really nice out of a really horrible uh, pandemic situation. So I'm also hoping that actually we can carry over even after this is through more of this uh, virtual sort of conferencing and uh, more interaction between us across time zones and around the world. Okay, so to get started, uh, I'm going to talk today about mechanistic modeling of CO2 leakage into the water column from offshore leaking CO2 wells or pipelines. So I call this mechanistic modeling because we're really looking at the physics of these processes and determining how CO2 will move from a reservoir up a well out into the water column and potentially to the, to the surface. So the context for this work, although I'll, I'll talk about the numerical methods, the context is not development of numerical me methods. The context is really risk assessment. And on this uh, area, we're really looking at the consequences or the impact side of the risk equation. Okay, so not the likelihood of such a release, but the consequences and the impacts of, of a release. And again, the context is uh, CO2 that would be transported and ejected offshore for geologic carbon sequestration. So the, the main uh, purpose of the work is to determine under what conditions high flow rate leakage incidents like CO2 uh, well blowouts or potentially pipeline ruptures can lead to CO2 coming out the sea surface. Okay, so that is the uh, human health impact side of this risk problem, not the environment in terms of uh, CO2 dissolving into seawater and changing pH. It's really CO2 arriving at the sea surface that we're concerned about. So the thing that separates the sea floor and the well and the pipeline from the surface where this risk is relevant is the water column. And for me, modeling in the water column was somewhat new. And I think for many of you uh, in the series, it may be new also. So I'll kind of be emphasizing that, even though for me, that's really the, the new area. And what are some of these impacts? I'm not gonna go into them in the talk, but you can imagine that uh, CO2 arriving at the sea surface could create an inhalation hazard for people on boats or people on platforms in the offshore region. And then CO2 bubbling up through water can create instabilities, uh, buoyancy issues, et cetera, for floating objects. And so you've got a, a potential hazard there for people. So how I'll go about this uh, is shown in this outline. Uh, kind of we'll be circling around uh, clockwise here. I'll describe first the project and the context a bit more that I'm doing this work some analogs for CO2 uh, blowouts that are useful to understand what might happen in the offshore environment. A little review about just the challenge of containing pressure. Then we'll get into the guts of the talk, which is the modeling part, uh, the results. And I'll share a little bit of personal uh, uh, part of the work here in my discussion of the analysis and related work. Uh, something you won't see in the, in the published paper. Okay, so with that, uh, let's just get started. So the motivation for the work is provided by interest in near offshore geologic carbon sequestration or GCS, for example, in the Gulf Coast region of the United States. So here's the US here, this is the Gulf of Mexico. This box here is mostly the Texas Gulf Coast, which is shown here blown up. And what's shown here is uh, a graphic depicting a lot of CO2 sources in the uh, Texas Gulf region, and then the uh, basically porosity times thickness of this very favorable Miocene geologic formation. It's, it's in the onshore region too, but it's shown here in the offshore region. So where this product is high, uh, we have a very large potential capacity for storing CO2. 
And so again, this is an opportune uh, area. The advantages of offshore CCS in the Gulf of Mexico are, are printed here. There's a, it's a very well studied geologic basin, again, in the onshore and offshore region. It's the same geology, a very high concentration of industrial CO2 emission sources onshore here. Uh, a lot of them are shown with by the green symbols. And then as I've dis discussed, there's this very nice geologic sink available. And these industrial sources, some of them are very close to the offshore region and petrochemical and refining facilities down here on the coast. So there's a lot of capture and transportation in terms of uh, pipelines, et cetera, in place. And then finally, there's actually a potential for some commercial CO2 enhanced oil recovery that could pot potentially offset costs. So these advantages are, are known and uh, this uh, recognition led to the development of this very nice project called GOMCAR. It's led by the Texas Bureau of Economic Geology and the Gulf Coast Carbon Center, which is housed within there, led by Sue Havorka, Tip Meckel, and Ramon Trevino. And so you can look at this website, but they're doing all sorts of work uh, related to uh, raising the, um, uh, demonstrating, I'd say, the utility and the capacity and the opportunity of this near offshore Texas Gulf Coast uh, and off Louisiana coast too region. So in this region, there's a little bit of an issue and that is there are many, many wells in this near offshore region. So the advantage again of a well-known basin with uh, lots of understanding through oil and gas production, this happens all around the world, also brings with it a bit of a hazard in the existence of, of current wells. So these are shown all over in deep water areas also, but the focus of Gome Carb and my focus today is actually this shallow, uh, very near offshore region. And the wells aren't shown here because these are the federal wells, but within this nine miles of state waters, there's actually a lot more wells also. So uh, this is a blow up of part of that uh, Texas uh, coastal region. And I just mentioned a nine mile boundary that's indicated by this red dashed line. So there are state waters from the shore out to nine miles. And here's some of the oil fields that are present out there with obviously platforms and a lot of wells associated with them. And Gold Carve has looked at the High Island 10L and the 24L blocks. Those are shown here. This is 10L and 24L. And I've superimposed on here uh, the same scale, a map showing the bathymetry. So the 10L region is 10L site is about here. The 24L site is about here. So that's 24L and 10L. And as you'll see, it's quite shallow. It's only about 10 meters of water at 10L and just a little bit more at 24L. So what we're looking at is the uh, potential for CO2 release into this water column in quite shallow uh, waters. So what can we do starting out looking at this problem? Well, we can look at, at analogs and see what we know from existing CO2 uh, wells and maybe pipelines. So, so onshore CO2 well blowouts are well documented, uh, but they will be very different from offshore blowouts. So let me just describe a few of the onshore cases. This is probably the most well documented one, the Sheep Mountain Dome. It's a natural CO2 dome in Colorado suffered a breach blowout in 1982 that was very difficult to kill. And Lynch wrote a very nice paper describing the blowout and all the challenges of killing that well. So what we knew from that is that a very high pressure CO2 emanating from the ground with very large cooling effects uh, creates dry ice. Uh, if there's water around hydrate, all sorts of interesting uh, phenomena that make it uh, hazardous and difficult to kill. Although notably, these are not flammable, so that's actually a, a big advantage. Uh, here's one from 2015. Uh, during a workover of a well, there was a blowout of CO2. You can see this uh, white cloud spreading out uh, below the rig here. So again, decompression results in very uh, large amounts of cooling. You tend to have dense gas spreading along the ground. This is one of the hazards of onshore CO2 blowouts. In this case, there was also H2S, and that's much more dangerous than the CO2 itself. So there was some evacuations. As far as I know, nobody was injured in this one. Now, this is another interesting one in Hungary. You see talks about every once in a while, 
um, large CO2 well uh, blew out and they had difficulty uh, controlling it. Again, a lot of decompression, cooling, very uh, dense. CO2 is a dense gas anyway. When it's cold, it's even denser, tends to hug the ground. You need to stay away from due to the inhalation hazard. So these are all onshore. And uh, there, in fact, there will be a lot of differences between an onshore blowout and an offshore blowout. In an offshore situation, in contrast to this dense gas, you will always have a buoyancy effect. So CO2 will want to move upwards in the water column. The water column, furthermore, provides a, a large source of heat. So the decompression cooling that you see here can in fact be um, compensated by the uh, whatever heat is in the ocean water nearby. Similarly, for the CO2 dissolution, which I'll talk a lot about, there's a huge capacity of seawater to take up the CO2. So there really are a lot of differences between the onshore and offshore situation. So in the offshore, we have a good uh, analog provided by natural gas blowouts. So there have been many of these deep and shallow water. I've just shown a couple of examples here. Here's a offshore platform for scale with a natural gas uh, blowout going on. You can see the turbulence I was talking about in the ocean. This is methane largely coming to the surface, a very large scale type of blowout. Here's another one from Vietnam in 1993. Again, the platform for scale, a large disrupted uh, ocean surface here as natural gas is bubbling up. I, I can perceive here kind of a bubble center of this uh, gas plume and then spreading out as you see on the sea surface. So these are good analogs for CO2. Again, methane, a lot less soluble than uh, seawater, but nevertheless a good uh, analog. So let's see. What I want to then uh, do now is to motivate the specific uh, questions that we're addressing for CO2 wells, not natural gas wells. And the main question I'll be looking at in this uh, brief version of the talk is under what blowout conditions will leaking CO2 make it to the sea surface? That is, will it not dissolve in the water column? So this will be a function of the depth of water, that is the thickness of this water column, uh, the leakage rate, orifice size, et cetera, et cetera. Some related questions might be, what are the possible blowout flow rates for given reservoir well conditions? And for example, as a function of orifice size, reservoir depth, well properties, et cetera. And then finally, in the risk assessment context, if CO2 is emitted into the atmosphere at the sea surface, what are the expected downwind safety distances? How quickly does it disperse? So I'm really only going to be talking about number one here, but let me show you the whole system, the whole conceptual model that we're uh, considering in general in this uh, project. So we have a reservoir at depth below the seafloor into which CO2 has been injected and is being stored, say, from an active injection well. So this injection well is connected by pipeline to a supply, probably uh, coming from onshore. And so CO2 is flowing down into the reservoir. It's quite mobile in the reservoir at this point as it's being injected. Now, as in the scenario, if something happens to this pipeline not too far from the wellhead, some sort of a break happens, uh, we would have CO2 at high pressure coming into the water column. Uh, it would flow up buoyantly, as I said, and lots of processes affecting uh, this plume. Eventually, it could potentially make it to the sea surface, where then it would be gaseous CO2, and it's uh, slightly denser than air, so it might hug the uh, sea surface a bit as winds and density effects tend to disperse it. So there's different ways we can analyze this different models, and I'll be talking about this where we use T2 well for the reservoir and the well part, and then a code called TAMOC for the uh, water column transport. I'll be getting later, not in this talk, but I'll be working on the National Risk Assessment Partnership, that's NRAP, multi-source leakage ROM. So this is a very simple atmospheric dispersion model that I'll be using later in the project. Okay, so those are the analogs. Let me go now to just review for people why uh, wells are a hazard. I've sketched here on the y-axis the depth down into the subsurface below the ground versus pressure on the x-axis. So 
zero pressure is basically atmospheric pressure. There's a few important gradients uh, that we have to consider when we have a well heading down here. We have the hydrostatic pressure gradient. This is provided by the water and gravity acting on it in the pores. And we have something called the frac gradient. So pressures at any depth above the frac gradient uh, tend to give rise to the possibility of the formation having fractures. Then there's a lithostatic uh, pressure gradient. If you exceed that pressure at any depth, you can simply lift the formation and open it up. Now let's suppose in our reservoir here we have a gas, methane or CO2, and that gas fills the well. So we, we would start with that reservoir pressure at the bottom of the well, and then within the well we'd be following a pressure gradient such as you see here because the gas is not very dense. If it were filled with water, it would follow this hydrostatic pressure gradient and be essentially at equal pressure with the formation. But if we have gas in the well, we have very high pressures at any depth relative to the formation. For example, here, gas is always at a higher pressure than the aquifer anywhere in this uh, from here up. From here up, the gas in the well is at uh, higher pressures than the frac and the lithostatic gradient. So we have a real issue if there's leakage from a well here. But overall, you can see at the surface, when we have a pipeline or a wellhead, we have a large delta P, okay, between the pressure that needs to be contained in the well and atmospheric pressure or even at the bottom of a shallow sea. Okay, so that's just to review kind of that wells are vulnerable to uh, fluid leakage you need to contain pressure. Okay, let me move now to the uh, main part of the talk here, the modeling part. So again, I'm showing the conceptual model that we're considering here. And the first part of the system that we will model, we'll use T2 well. This is a integration of TUF2, which is a subsurface porous media reservoir simulator with uh, equations for well flow. And these are the drift flux model. Uh, Lewa Pan is built into T2 well for, flow it, for modeling flow of fluids up the uh, well pipe, and that's coupled directly to the normal TUF2, which is modeling the multi-phase version of Darcy's Law. Okay, so T2Well handles the flow coupled from the reservoir with the well, and then from the well or pipeline out into the water column, and it stops. That's T2Well. Now, just to let you know, there's nothing unusual in the results that I'll show. We have some very generic sorts of properties of this system, uppermost, uh, lowermost cap rock, about 3,000 meters, so it's a fairly deep system, but very generic porosity, permeability, uh, nothing unusual in this reservoir. So it will be delivering fluid to the bottom of the well as the blowout occurs in a very uh, generic but realistic way. And similarly for the surface pipe in the well, it's a five inch uh, pipe it's horizontal. The hole is 10 meters away from the wellhead. The uh, tubing of the uh, well where the CO2 is flowing up is a nine and five inch, sorry, five inch tubing also with nine and five inch casing. So we've just put some very generic uh, properties into the system, but we think they're very realistic. So there's nothing unusual here. So the only difference in the cases that I'm going to show is the water column depth. So the reservoir and well pipeline system all remain the same. Okay, so what do we do once we calculate the flow uh, coming out of this hole with T2 well? We pass that input to a code called TAMUC. This is the Texas A&M uh, outfall calculator. And so I've just expanded here the domain of consideration for that code. This is the water column. Uh, in this case, I've just shown the 50 meter case, but I'm going to look at different uh, heights of the water column. I'm considering an isothermal uh, uh, uniform temperature within this depth. You're seeing here a schematic of uh, the flow. It starts out as a jet and then becomes a buoyant bubble plume fairly quickly, bubbles dissolving in the seawater the whole time. I've put in here the flow rates just for this particular case that were generated uh, from the T2 well simulation. So we have 35 kilograms per second of CO2 coming out of this hole at a temperature of 13 degrees C. So there's decompression cooling, as I'll explain, which led to this temperature. 
and 35 kilograms per second is about a million tons per year. So that's about the leakage flow rate we're going to be looking at uh, throughout. So how do you model these systems in the water column? Well, I didn't know anything about this until a year and a half ago or so, and I learned that much of the work uh, for oil well blowouts builds on even earlier work. Um, this was work by Fisher in a nice textbook and Henderson Sellers. And, and basically a schematic of this approach is shown here. If you have some sort of a, uh, a leaking point, uh, it can be described by an orifice diameter. And there's a velocity profile here, a, a square top hat type function. So we have fluid exiting this orifice at a uniform velocity across the lateral distance. Immediately as it does so, it starts to entrain surrounding water. And so it transfers momentum to that water, drags it up. We start to get velocity profiles that look like this as this uh, jet and moves upwards. And insofar as, as it has buoyancy, it starts to generate its own ability to move upwards. But the point is here, there's a large amount of entrainment and we get these evolution of velocity profiles. So uh, I've said most of this, uh, there are these zones called the zone of flow establishment and the zone of established flow, kind of unfortunate acronyms, but, but uh, the, the gist of it is that there have been developed very nice ways called uh, integral models to model this sort of uh, a behavior without doing computational fluid dynamics, essentially. So um, I'll describe that a bit more as I go on here. So uh, here's another sketch more pertinent to our particular case where we've got the pipeline again at CO2. And I've just sketched in some of these sort of just schematically velocity profiles as this jet evolves into a buoyant bubble plume and it moves upwards. So we entrain water, we widen the velocity, we, it decreases in vertical velocity as well. And the way these integral models work is, is shown here uh, schematically. This is kind of one slice of this plume we have vertical velocity w, it's changing as a function of z. The radius is changing as a function of z as water is entrained, bubbles spread out. And then there's this all important entrainment velocity ue. And just keep in mind that the entrainment velocity is kind of about one tenth, just order of magnitude of the vertical velocity. So you're always entraining fluid as this uh, plume moves upwards. So is this realistic at all? Well, this is a, a sketch from the Macondo well, and you're seeing here down about 5,000 feet of depth, a very strongly gaseous oil mixture emanating from a small orifice where the riser uh, broke off. And you can kind of see that phenomenon. You see a jet here, very fast flows, but very quickly it's in training seawater. You get these turbulent sort of uh, bulging structures. And so, it looks uh, very plausible that this is behaving like uh, I described in the previous uh, slide. So integral models turn out to be a very efficient way of modeling this kind of very complex uh, turbulent system. So TAMOC is one of these integral models. It's actually a suite of codes, a lot of different modules uh, developed at Texas A&M by Scott Sokolowski and his group. Uh, schematically, you can kind of think of it this way, it, it needs some inputs of particle or bubble size distribution. What are these bubbles? What's their composition? What's their flux? How fast are they coming into the system? From there, there's a choice of different modules that one can use depending on what you want to simulate. In my case, I looked at what's called the bent plume model. So this is a buoyant bubble plume coming in, but there's a little bit of cross flow. So that's a example of forced entrainment. It tends to push the plume a little bit. I just used a very nominal amount just to use the bent plume model. And then all the time we are uh, looking at the ambient water column in terms of its temperature, its salinity, and uh, concentration of whatever substance is in these bubbles. And then there's discrete bubble models. We need to be looking at each bubble and depending on what's in it, uh, what its density is, uh, what its solubility is, uh, what its physical properties are. So these models get uh, put together, the discrete particle and bubble model uh, with a Lagrangian particle model. We're following these particles within the plume. And then there's the plume itself. The plume itself has a Lagrangian component also as it's moving and being forced by cross flow. 
And so within the plume element, we need to conserve and keep track of mass, momentum, buoyancy, heat, and the, the dissolved components. Uh, and the particles, remember, the bubbles are going to move within the plume element, and they may even leave the plume, and that's illustrated here. I don't have such a strong cross-flow in the case I'll show. So in TAMWOC, there's a lot of these uh, ODEs. Uh, they're solved using SciPy uh, with this variable coefficient ODE solver using backward differentiation formulas. And I should say, again, I'm not going to get into details of TAMOC here, but there are a lot of nice papers, a lot of work has been done uh, using TAMOC, and I've, I was just very impressed to learn about this whole community, largely working on uh, oil spills and uh, whatnot, but uh, getting into the CO2 world is it's becoming more important. Okay, so the physical processes in TAMOC modeled are the jet flow of gas into the water column, the transition of that jet to a bubbly flow. Uh, it's using the case that I used, uh, top hat velocity profiles all the time, but with a uh, fluid entrainment, buoyant bubble rise with rise dynamics based on bubble size distribution. Equations of state, as I've mentioned, the cross flow of seawater, stratification of seawater, it can do, I didn't do this, and then the salinity, pressure, and temperature. So the most important thing here, getting right to it, is buoyant bubble rise with dynamics based on, uh, on the bubble size. So this is kind of the first part of the results is uh, one needs to calculate the bubble distribution. So in my case, I had a discharge Q, came from T2 well of CO2 with certain density and certain aperture. And you go through this workflow of calculating a velocity that will be uh, what TAMOC is considering uh, coming into the system. We have uh, momentum fluxes, buoyancy fluxes. These combine to form a length scale for the uh, jet intrusion, basically. If you have a lot of momentum, the jet's bigger. If you have a lot of buoyancy, the jet is smaller. It becomes a buoyant plume sooner. And the Weber number is this uh, relationship between uh, inertial momentum that tends to uh, disfavor bubbles, make them small versus surface tension, which tends to favor the bubbles. And so empirically, there's a relationship here what the mean bubble size is. And then using this Ross and Rambler distribution, I went and created the volume fraction of bubbles for this carbon dioxide case. And they're very similar for a 50 meter water column and a 10 meter water column. And that's what's shown here. The main result here is the mean bubble size is about half a millimeter. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so that's the modeling. Let's go quickly to results. I'm looking at the, the clock here. Uh, we have uh, first the results from the uh, T2 well part of this problem. So this is a reservoir in the well. I'm showing mass flow rate versus log time. And I'll just focus your attention on the uh, nearly steady state uh, gaseous CO2 for the 50 meter case and gaseous CO2 for the 10 meter case. So uh, what's coming out of that uh, pipe down there is again about 36 uh, kilograms per second or so of CO2. And in terms of its temperature, this is the wellhead WH and uh, LKS is the leakage source. So I want to focus your attention on the temperature in the 50 and the 10 meter case at the leakage source. That's what's going into the water column model of TAMOC. So it's about 13 degrees for the 50 meter case and about eight degrees for the 10 meter case. Okay, so again, uh, I'm showing here two uh, of the end member uh, domains that I modeled. Uh, this is a 10 meter thick water column and this is the 50 meter thick water column and I have a few intermediates. Uh, but what you're seeing is, again, everything the same except thickness of water column, okay? So let's look at the results. So on the left is shown the time it takes from the leak point to the surface as a function of the different water column heights. So the 10 meter deep water column, it takes just a fraction of a second for the CO2 to get to the top. For the 50 meter case, it takes five seconds. Okay, keep that number in mind. It takes five seconds to get CO2 through this 50 meter water column. Now here's the main result. How much of the CO2 is emitted at the sea surface? That's in black here, CO2 emitted at sea surface. For the 10 meter case, it's nearly 35 kilograms per second. It's just about all the CO2 that went in. 
It diminishes rapidly though as water column height gets thicker till we get to 50 meter thick water column almost none of the CO2 that came in exits. It's all absorbed. It's all dissolved. And that's what's shown here in blue. So the amount, the fraction of CO2 entering to what is emitted, uh, uh, sorry, what's absorbed uh, is shown here. So we have almost 100% absorption or dissolution for the, for the 50 meter case. Okay, now uh, let's see. Final result I'll show is, is just this bit of plume deflection. So this is the plume center line versus depth for the 10 meter case and the 50 meter case. And the dashed lines show that the plume spread. So the 50 meter case, it spreads to about 15 meters in diameter at the sea surface. The 10 meter case hardly spreads at all. The 10 meter case hardly deflected. This is the center line. So there's just this small deflection, but I just had a nominal 0.15 meter per second. Uh, uh, cross flow. Okay, now I want to uh, break in and uh, provide a little bit of this uh, narrative related to the uh, personal side of this, and that is I produced these results. It was really quite a new uh, approach for me using TAMOC, and I really was incredulous about it. I could hardly believe that all that CO2 was being absorbed a million tons per year, even in the 50 meter case. And so I uh, thought about how else can I look at this? And uh, uh, things were you know, busy as usual, but uh, I came up with one sort of back of the envelope approach that allowed me to relax and realize it could be correct. And that was to look at a single bubble and look at the mass transfer from the bubble to the seawater. This is this mass transfer equation that is being solved in Tamak actually, where mass change within the bubbles equal to the surface area times a, uh, a mass transfer coefficient times the change of concentration uh, between the surface of the bubble and the ambient fluid. And so I could rearrange this a little bit in an order of magnitude sense and derive what the uh, time scale was for the rate of change, sorry, for the change of mass. So I'm just going to look at how long it should take for the CO2 in a bubble to dissolve and putting in all sorts of reasonable and sometimes conservative uh, values from the literature, uh, looking at the solubility of CO2, which is really an important part of this whole problem. It's extremely high in seawater, you know, almost three kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of seawater for the shallow case and even more for the deep case because it's at higher pressure. I determined that the time to dissolve the bubble is about 1.14 seconds. Now recall that the plume needed five seconds to reach the surface in the 50 meter case. So my average bubbles are gonna easily have enough time to dissolve. Okay, so this was comforting enough. I'm gonna skip the final point for the sake of time. This was comforting enough to me to go ahead and submit the paper, uh, which I did. And uh, the months went on. That was in September of 2019. I gave a talk on this at Stanford. There was a little bit of incredulity there too. I gave a talk on it at AGU in December last year. And I just still felt like, you know, is this right? Is this correct? And so uh, we were actually, I gave the talk on a late Friday afternoon at AGU the last day and early the next morning, my wife and I were flying away on vacation. And so there I was, you know, very nervous about this result, scribbling things on napkins and pieces of paper, trying to come up with something that would justify this more to me. And finally on the plane, it, it came to me. So what I did is to ask the question, what is the rate of seawater entrainment needed to fully dissolve my CO2 blowout? Okay, so I considered a conical uh, shape here for the plume and looking back at this element, and you remember that I said the entrainment velocity is about one-tenth of the vertical velocity, okay? So using a whole lot of reasonable values again, the uh, uh, solubility of CO2 and turning that into a, a how much seawater do I need to dissolve the CO2 that I've released? It turns out to be 18 cubic meters of seawater per second. I need to entrain that much to dissolve the CO2 I'm emitting. And when I looked at the surface area of the cone and I look at the uh, uh, vertical velocity, remember it took five seconds to go 50 meters, uh, I can determine that uh, my entrainment velocity again is about one-tenth of that. So that's about one meter per second. So 
comparing these, I can see the plume is entraining about 66 times more water than I would need to dissolve the CO2. Okay, so totally happy. Uh, vacation went very well. I could relax. So uh, that's just a little bit of the personal part of the, uh, the back of the envelope types of things that make us comfortable. Now, it turns out there's been a lot of related work coming out very recently, but slightly before I, I submitted this and then after that, that also makes one feel very comfortable about this result. So this is work by uh, J Jonas Gross, who was a great uh, help to me in using TAMUP. He looks at the uh, Panaria natural seep, among other things, in Italy. These are CO2 bubbles coming out naturally. He does all sorts of interesting work, of, uh, including the geochemical part of, uh, of dissolution using various models. And this is just a quote from, from their paper. It says, in the absence of strong bubble plumes, the high solubility of CO2 leads to its rapid aqueous dissolution from bubbles within a few meters of their emission into the sea. So here's just a picture of some of these bubbles, but just within a few meters, they see the same dissolution effect. Okay, some more recent work. This is uh, Olson and Skatna, and uh, using CFD approaches, solving uh, very nice Navier-Stokes equations with all sorts of uh, sophisticated uh, turbulence models and whatnot. So true computational fluid dynamics uh, using ANSYS with some validation shown here for their model and some observations, they produce these beautiful graphics looking at two different cases, uh, methane release and a CO2 release at these rates in 30 meters of water. And as I said, methane is a lot less soluble in, in water. So you tend to get it moving through the water column and emitted at the sea surface. Whereas look at this, this is a very large release rate, only 1% of the CO2 surfaced uh, from their simulation results. So again, showing some uh, uh, corroboration to this fact, I think a very high solubility of CO2 and very large attenuation in the water column. Finally, the very recent paper uh, came out in 2020 with a very large scale oceanographic model applicable to this uh, South Korea site and just very quickly, uh, again, sophisticated type of uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Just one figure I'll show you here. This is 200 meters of height, CO2 released down below. All of it gets dissolved. In all cases, CO2 bubbles were dissolved entirely before reaching the sea surface. Okay, so let me uh, skip quickly now just to the conclusion. So offshore sites are being considered for geologic carbon sequestration in the U.S. Gulf Coast. There is a need to understand the risks of CO2 blowouts at offshore sites. We know that uh, offshore blowouts will behave very differently from onshore blowouts because of the strong effects of the water column. So to look at this, we loosely coupled two models, T2Well and TAMOC. And what we found was for quite a large blowout, the median bubble size was about 0.5 millimeters, which is quite small, but this is due to the vigor of that release. And for a 50 meter, deep water column, 99% of the CO2 is dissolved before reaching the sea surface. For the 10 meter deep water column, it's the opposite. About 94% is emitted. There's very little dissolution. The TAMOC results can be rationalized in totally independently by estimates of the mass transfer rate from the median sized bubble, the time that that takes, and then by the seawater entrainment argument that I showed you. And finally, uh, our finding of large water column dissolution agrees qualitatively with results from other groups uh, using totally, totally different methods in some cases. So I just want to acknowledge uh, my co-author, Le Wa Pan, for producing the T2 well simulations. And then a huge thanks to Scott Sokolowski from Texas A&M and Jonas or Jonas Gross from uh, the Helmholtz Center in Kiel. They really helped me a lot with uh, getting up to speed on TAMOC and then the people at the Bureau of Economic Geology, Margaret Murakami, Suha Borka, Ramon Trevino, Tip Meckel, uh, all obviously supported the project and assisted with uh, characterizing this near offshore region. So with that, I thank you and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Kurt, uh, for this very interesting talk. Uh, you could, uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to give the
stage to Sebastian to actually start with uh, some discussion and some sort of uh, conversation with you over the, the, this interesting yet very important uh, topic. Please, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much, Kurt, for a really interesting, important talk. So we have a few questions coming in already, and please do enter more questions in the chat room. So the first one is from Sarah. Um, thank you for the interesting talk, and she's wondering how monitoring can be done to collect field data and validate the modeling in the case there's a real blowout for well, what, what data could we measure um, to understand the system process better and validate the models. Well, just the on the um, monitoring, I'd say, of the releases of bubble flows, it's actually a huge area and people are quite experienced at doing this. So uh, bubbles create a fairly large contrast, you can imagine, with water. So all sorts of uh, sonar types of approaches uh, work quite well. Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, visual uh, approaches work too. You can see bubbles, so cameras and things like that. Um, again, it's, a, I'd say, a fairly large, uh, well-developed area. Uh, and most of this experience has come, again, from the oil and gas context, where there's just been incidents, but also lots and lots of experience and success in you know, containing fluids in the subsurface. Now, there might have been a little bit of a um, uh, part of that question is sort of to prevent uh, these incidents from happening. And so that too, I'd say there's experience with, uh, but it's challenging. I mean, you need to uh, keep track of the properties of the steel, basically, that's containing the pressure that I mentioned. That's both in a pipeline and in the well. So there are various logs people do of the wells to look for thinning due to corrosion. Um, obviously, any mechanical deformations that may occur due to, you know, faulting or some sort of uh, uh, slumping, perhaps, of the seafloor uh, can be found through well logs. So one needs to basically uh, maintain and monitor uh, equipment to try to prevent these things from happening. I guess where all the automation comes in very important. There's a lot of work here, at least in the North Sea at the moment, and that's familiar with the Gulf of Mexico, but how to use autonomous subsea vehicles. You can't send the divers yeah. down there to check manually with your pipelines and valves, yeah. et cetera, so working properly. We have a question from Leila. Um, again, thanking you for a great talk. Um, she asks, one of the experimental studies that have been conducted to quantify turbulence modeling. Is complex yes, I think I did trajectory. come across uh, some experiments on this. Um, there are some really nice uh, experimental facilities. I know, you know, it, it, it's just possible to, in a building, create a tank and replicate these kinds of systems with you know, say meter to 10 meter length scales. So I'm sorry I can't give you specifics um, of the particular papers, but I do recall seeing uh, people doing experiments. And uh, maybe someone wants to chat in, by the way, in this discussion, uh, somebody who's done that kind of work. But yeah, it's a very, um, what should I say, it's, it's something you can do in the lab. It's not out of reach and not even, uh, it, you know, it's not necessarily like a very high pressure experiment, et cetera. You just need a big tank and some pumps. Oversimplified from a numerical modeler. Probably use some, <laughs> that probably use some analog fluids as well if needed. A question from George Costa Gomes. Um, yes, out of curiosity, would the density of the seawater affect the results? So if you think of different ocean seas around yeah, it has a, a minor effect, I would say. And you could see that in my own results. So between the 10 meter and the 50 meter water column case, the only differences, only difference that arose was basically the pressure at the orifice. Okay, so changing the density of the seawater would have the same effect. It would just be maybe a slightly higher pressure at the orifice for a more saline, colder ocean and that produces a slightly smaller leakage rate. But this change was really quite small, as you saw in my results, both for the estimate of that uh, median particle size, 
as well as for the ultimate uh, outflow. You might have seen something a little more interesting on the temperature plot. You saw there was more decompression cooling in the 10 meter case because the pressure is lower on the other side of that orifice. But uh, it definitely has an effect, but uh, not, a, mm -hmm. not a huge one, uh, given the huge overpressure, I guess, that's involved uh, coming out of that pipe or out of the well. So we have a question that is along the same lines from Charles Du Bois, um, also thank you for an interesting talk. And he wonders, what do your results mean for leak detection of near shore CO2 pipelines wells? Also, do you expect do you expect a variation of escape CO2 in warmer yeah, cooler shore? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think you know you can see that uh, leaks below a certain threshold will not surface, and so if you want to detect those, you're going to have to use uh, some sort of a subsea approach or some sort of sonar, something that's looking for bubbles closer to the pipe itself. If you're only interested in very large leaks, which I don't recommend, uh, you could rely on surface approaches. But I'd say this is probably a strong motivation to really get yourself down there, look for bubbles uh, near the leakage source. Uh, what was the last part of the question? So the second part was, um, uh, you sort of alluded to this a little bit, but do you expect the creation of escape CO2 yeah. warm and cool? Yeah. So areas? that's an interesting one. Again, solubility is the main control on what I observed of this absorption. So warmer aqueous phases typically can dissolve less gas. So we would have more of a, a, a the, uh, tendency for the CO2 to get to the surface in a warmer uh, sea. Again, I think these effects are uh, overwhelmed probably by, you know, other controls like the overpressure that's driving the gas and size of the orifice and things like that. There is a second question from Leila, and this is, that question is related to another question from Yuan Wang, so I'm going to read both questions to you. Um, so. Leila asks, my second question, thank you for the answer, and says, my second question is, could these events happen with other fluids, especially hydrogen? And Yuang's question relates to this. I'm thanking you for a nice talk. I wonder in hydrogen subsurface storage, major chance to prevent leakage. Would you comment on leakage of hydrogen volume those events? So what is the crossover that you could learn from your CO2 work to other fluids that you think we may consider pumping Subsurface. Yeah, another really interesting question. So I would say, of course, if any gas at pressure is subject to the type of leak that I showed, uh, I believe hydrogen would be less soluble. I think CO2 is especially soluble in water. I'm not 100% positive about this, but I would expect it to um, expand, uh, take up a lot of volume, obviously, such a light uh, gas, and probably uh, be much more like methane in moving up through the water column, uh, tending not to dissolve as much and more likely to make it to the sea surface. Once at the sea surface, again, it's very light and would uh, tend to dissipate, I think, uh, more effectively than CO2 would. Um, so I guess less dissolution, more uh, for the same mass, obviously huge, huge volumes, but very similar sorts of things I would think would happen. I, that's a great question about the, um, you know, I wasn't looking at it, but the e ecological or the environmental impact side of that comes to mind. And I'm not sure I've seen anybody look at that yet. So that might be a very interesting uh, thing. I think there are uh, microbes, depending on what sorts of compounds get produced as H2 dissolves into the water, there may very well be microbial uh, activity associated with that. And, CO2, we kind of all know about pH, you know, and it's all about pH. Uh, but there are environmental impacts, again, I didn't look at, but that might be something that people would be interested in to look at the differences between hydrogen and CO2. Interesting question. Have another question here from Musa Hussein Mayer. Um, and thanking you for the talk. Um, I'm wondering how accurate the existing models can measure the effect of reactivity of CO2 in medium when fractures are present. Okay, well, I f by saying when fractures are present, I think this is referring to within the reservoir itself, mm -hmm. 
and <clears throat> reactivity of CO2. Again, it's not in the model that I presented, uh, but many, many people in the geologic carbon sequestration context have worked on the reactions that attend uh, geologic carbon sequestration. So that's carbon dioxide dissolved in water, and then that water reacting with minerals in the matrix of the rock. And then so far as a fracture may allow greater access for fluids to flow and contact rock. Uh, this is a fairly well studied area. Again, I didn't look at any of that in my talk. And just to uh, expand on something I, I said, but maybe people didn't catch the significance of it. We were considering a an injection well, and so CO2 is being injected actively into that well. And as I said, I expect in that scenario the CO2 to be more mobile near the well than in a more mature geologic carbon sequestration reservoir, because we've just injected it. It's mobile. It's moving away from the well. And now we have a leak, that CO2 is still mobile, it can move toward the well and up and out. And if you're talking about older reservoirs or leaks happening up wells that have, in a mature geologic carbon sequestration site, you're much more likely to be faced with lower CO2 saturations, much uh, lower mobility for the CO2, and so a lower uh, well blowout leakage rate, let's say. And uh, again, we just chose the scenario we chose, uh, but this is the importance of always coupling reservoir and well flow. They don't exist independently. They're very tightly mm -hmm. connected. So two more questions, I think, then we're sort of running against or a lot of time to take. Um, Alwyn's Lewinbrook's question first, um, how long does the CO2 stay dissolved in the seawater? So CO2 saturated water drift to the surface and does it release the CO2 there? Great question again. So I didn't really look at this because of my acute human health risk assessment emphasis. But yes, I believe that, OK, we absorb a lot of CO2 into the seawater. It's not going to stay there forever. So I do believe ultimately the CO2 comes back to the surface. It uh, diffuses into the atmosphere. Uh, in no sense is what I've described, should it be considered like uh, trapping of CO2. I mean, this is a loss of uh, integrity of a system and the CO2 is effectively lost. So yeah, very interesting question. And the last question from Christina Strippich, um, thanking you again for the great presentation. Have you maybe consider what happens inside of the pipeline well or as a result of the leakage? Um, yeah, we don't, but uh, this is a, another super interesting and important point. Um, in an uncontrolled flow like this, you can have a lot of reservoir damage. That is, sand and fines can get mobilized from the reservoir and move up the well. And this is known in you know gas withdrawal at underground gas storage facilities. It's known in various fluid productions, we get erosive effects in the piping, in the case, in the tubing due to sand and whatnot. So one could expect if this went on for very long that yes, you could uh, really be damaging the tubing, you could be damaging the pipeline, it could cause the orifice to enlarge in size over time, again, due to the entrainment of uh, materials from the reservoir itself. So uh, yeah. Good point. I didn't look at any of that. Okay. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you for answering all these questions so diligently. Thank you to the audience for posing all these interesting questions. And I hand over to Hardy for some final comments. Yeah, thanks very much from my side too, as well, Sebastian Kurt and the audience. Uh, very nice discussion. A lot of research yet to be done, and a lot have been already done as well. Uh, so I would like to take the chance to announce our next weekend speaker is uh, Dr. Joshua White from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We stay uh, in California region until the next time to come back to Europe side. So Josh will speak about computational geomechanics on next generation computing platforms. So until next week, uh, stay happy, healthy and tuned and we we'll see you next week. Thank you very much, uh, Court, for this very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank again, you everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.